The year is 2028, and the city of Detroit has handed over control of the police department to mega corporation Omnicorp. What could possibly go wrong when the corporation runs the police? After one of their robot drones malfunctions, a junior executive is given the chance to implement his alternative solution a cyborg policeman named, of course, Robocop, because this is the plot of the movie Robocop. Now, obviously, we aren't going to see anything as advanced as Robocop in the next six years, is disappointing. Oh, we know. Pretty much a common theme here on the Science of Science Fiction channel. We shit all over your futuristic hopes and dreams. But look, fear not. Cyborgs are a very real possibility in the near future. And depending on who you ask, they might already exist. Look, the word cyborg is a portmanteau of cybernetic, an organism, a form of life that is part human and part machine. I am part human, part machine. I have a big metal plate in my shoulder. Yes, cyborg, real. In several real ways, they already exist. Anyone with a cochlear implant, a pacemaker, or one of those really fancy prosthetic limbs that they have at least limited control over could be considered a cyborg, technically speaking, but I guess not me, because I can't control this thing. Now, of course, that's not what most people think of when they think of cyborgs. We think of things like Robocop, Darth Vader, Inspector Gadget, the Borg from Star Trek. Colloquially, a cyborg is someone whose physical abilities have been enhanced beyond that of a regular person thanks to their mechanical implants. These are upgrades that would not have to be made out of necessity, but could be effective enhancements to improve someone's life. You might not be there yet, but we're well on our way, as we will find out in today's episode, and it's awesome. Where we are now? Alright, look, there are several forms in which humans already integrate with machines. We mentioned a few already, and cochlear implants and pacemakers are... Well, cool as they are, they're still extremely rudimentary compared to what we want. Both of these devices, they only work in one direction, receiving external input and delivering it as output to your body. A cochlear implant picks up on external sound and converts that to an electronic signal that is sent directly to the cochlea. See where the name from? It's funny as well. Cock. Clear. And that stimulates your auditory nerve directly. And I am aware I have the humor of a five year old. A pacemaker measures your heart rate and helps a little jolt if your heart starts going a little too slow. Now, while they are both incredible medical devices, the host body has no control over them. And look, we want our cyborgs to have full control over their augmented abilities. So, we're going to have to go a bit further. And that brings us to prosthetics. There are several different types of prosthetic limbs, the most basic of which are almost entirely for show rather than utility. Now, the predominant form of controlling prosthetics is something called myoelectric control. Though this technology was first developed in 1948, it has improved dramatically since then. Myoelectric prosthesis works by reading these tiny electric signals in the muscles at the site of an amputation and converting those into movements for a mechanized arm. Now, while original designs could only read a single muscle, they have advanced to read more complex muscle groups and allow for a wide range of motion. Unfortunately, there are still limitations. The electrical signals being read are extremely small, often the same size as other background noise, and this can result in the occasional error in motion. And mechanical hands are also capable of a variety of different grips and configurations, but these may need to be adjusted manually by controls on the hand, as the information being read simply is just not detailed enough to give a full range of motion. But look. Despite their limitations, these are still really impressive works of engineering and biology. We don't want to shit on that. It is very, very cool. They're also aimed at restoring a person's normal abilities, not augmenting them, which is the goal that we want to reach with future cyborgs. So, where are we going? Well, one of the main limitations of current mechanical limbs is their means of control. Not only is myoelectric control a bit imprecise, but the means are rather deliberate and they're on a small delay. When the alternative is having no arm. This is theoretically a huge step forward, though many amputees seem to have mixed feelings at best, but ideally the motions should be just as fluid and precise as a normal human body part. Part of this is going to come from engineering of the physical arms themselves, but this is likely a small hurdle. The more important step is for the motions of such prosthetics not to come from small signals in the muscles, but from the brain itself. And that is a huge step forward in science. 
No. They aren't widely available yet, but there are several types of these arms and hands already undergoing clinical trials. And rather than being a removable piece that the stump is inserted into, these advanced prosthetics are surgically attached to the muscle, nerve endings, and bone. Because they're connected to nerve endings, the mechanical arm and hand are controlled entirely by the brain, and they require almost no training to use. Myoelectric controls, they might be pretty intuitive, but they still take some getting used to, especially when compared to the upcoming models. You see, these mind control prosthetics offer a huge advantage over previous models, one that is a major breakthrough for the future of cyborg technology. They give users the sensation of touch. A skin-like glove is placed over the robotic hand, and that can contain a number of pressure sensors, which allows the user to feel varying levels of pressure as well as whether an object is smooth or rough. This is an incredible new technology. So, of course, there are going to be some limitations. The pressure sensors allow the hand to feel when and how hard it is to touch something, which greatly improves control. But the touch sensation is almost like a dimmer switch. Something is there or it isn't with varying degrees of intensity. But that thing, it doesn't feel hot, it doesn't feel wet or velvety. But even so, that would be asking for a lot. And even for these prosthetics, just to have the level of touch that they do is is amazing and it's a huge step to us becoming cyborgs that we're all very excited about but all of this so far is about restoring a body's original functionality and the goal of a cyborg is to surpass that of an ordinary or even an extraordinary human like myself so is anyone actually researching and experimenting in that field and the answer is yeah but it's a lot more niche, so let's explain. Neil Harbison is a Spanish-born artist, and he's been referred to in media as the world's first legally recognized cyborg, though it's unclear who, if anyone, has officially recognized him as such. He is also, at a minimum, one of three people to have been given that distinction by the media. You see, Neil was born with achromatic vision, also known as total color blindness. Now, seeing the entire world in black and white, not exactly an ideal thing for an artist. So, to help address his problem, Neil created the cyborg antenna colloquially referred to as the eyeborg. The eyeborg, clever name, is an antenna that is surgically implanted into Neil's skull, extending outward and placing a small wireless camera in front of his face. The camera takes in information and causes the end implanted in his skull to audibly vibrate, letting him essentially hear colors. Now, this may sound like another tool for restoring original functionality, but the eyeborg gives Neil an ability that humans actually lack the ability to perceive both infrared and ultraviolet light. One of Neil's other enhancements, in a manner of speaking, is a Bluetooth tooth that is paired with an identical tooth implanted in fellow Spanish artist Moon Rabas. These teeth allow the pair to communicate with each other remotely by tapping their teeth in Morse code. We're not convinced. <laughs> what are you up to? The eye thing's cool, but this is just weird, dude. We're not convinced this is going to catch on as an alternative to texting, but it is a thing that for some reason exists. We still wonder why. Why? <laughs> Though not an implant, at least not yet, Moon does have one other particularly interesting enhancement. <laughs> More interesting than an incredible Bluetooth tooth. Let's find out. The Speedborg was originally developed as a pair of gloves that allows it to detect the exact speed of nearby objects through vibrations in her hands. The technology has since been adapted to a pair of Speedborg earrings that allow it to detect a full 360 degree range of motion. It's not the same as 360 degrees of sight, but it shows that our minds can be trained to utilize our senses in ways that we aren't normally used to. This should come as no surprise, as humans, even those without impaired vision, can learn to use echo location like a bat with relative ease, we just don't bother because we have eyes. While Neil and Moon's forays into cyborg technology have mainly been strange things for the sake of art with small glimmers of actual utility. <laughs> Really small. Another recent advancement holds huge implications for the potential of human computer interfacing. An ALS patient in Switzerland had a chip implanted into his brain that allows him to communicate using a computer. The 36 year old man was completely paralyzed, unable to move even his eyes to communicate even more, and he had been unable to communicate for months before the implant. His first message after the surgery was, I want a beer, as well as requesting that they loudly play music by tool because he's paralyzed. <laughs> He's not dead. This is amazing. A <laughs> legend. This was like a beer. For fuck's sake. It's been months. <laughs> 
can't, you don't want a beer. This was a major breakthrough because it was unknown whether or not a person who had lost all voluntary muscle control would be able to communicate in any way. It's a slow process as the man must repeatedly go through the alphabet and think yes or no to every letter over and over again to form a sentence, but it shows that we have the ability to interact with machines using only our minds. And boy, does that sound like a lot of work for a beer, but also worth it. And the reality is we could expect great things as this technology improves. Where we want to go. Look, we want to outrun Usain Bolt with ease, punch through a brick wall like it was wet paper, and be able to experience a 360 degree field of view. But what we absolutely don't want is to communicate by tapping out Morse code with our teeth because it's just silly. There are a lot of different things that need to happen in order for our cyborg dreams to become a reality. But with the amount of research being done, it might not take long for them to fall into place. We are making more responsive and agile prosthetic limbs. We are increasing our ability to directly interface with the computer with just human thought. And we are experimenting with ways to expand our ability to perceive the world around us by utilizing our senses in a whole bunch of different ways. At the present rate of speed, a wide array of mind control replacement body parts could become available as early as the 2030s or 2040s. In addition to prosthetic limbs, there's also research into things like bionic eyes, bionic noses, which can replace lost senses. Bionic eyes are not yet able to grant natural vision to a person, but they are connected to a person's optic nerves to produce flashes of light, forming shapes that allow them to at least approximate their surroundings, which, frankly, that's pretty sick. There are two big hurdles for bionic eyes, both of which will be important for further advancements in cyborg technology. One is that electrodes need to become smaller so that they can more accurately pinpoint where to send electric impulses. The other is that we need to improve our understanding of exactly how these nerve signals are used to send information to the brain. The more work we do there, the greater our understanding will become until we reach a point where we can use bionic vision to recreate a person's normal vision, Geordie LaForge style. But why stop there? Once we have a complete understanding, of how the brain interprets these signals, what to stop us from allowing a bionic eye from detecting infrared and ultraviolet, like Neil's eyeborg? It could even be fitted with thermal vision or night vision that the user could toggle on and off with only a thought. In terms of becoming a technical possibility, it's quite likely that electronic implants used to improve a person's natural abilities will be available, at least in clinical trials, before the end of the century. That sounds pretty great, but what about it becoming a practical possibility? Well, there are a number of factors that could prevent the practical implementation of superhuman cyborgs. One is weight. A typical myoelectric controlled arm weighs over three pounds, which is roughly the same weight as the missing part of the arm for an adult. Even though it has what would be considered an appropriate weight, many users find them to be too heavy and uncomfortable to the point that they stop wearing them entirely. Then these are designed as lightweight appendages, not something that would be nearly powerful or durable enough to punch through a wall. It's likely that the more advanced models that connect directly to the person's skeleton won't feel as unwieldy as the weight isn't being supported entirely by muscles that already have other work to do, but the sample size is still too small to be sure yet. And look, there are just a lot of questions that we simply don't have the answers to yet. Would replacing your arm with a bionic arm capable of punching through a wall re require you to replace other body parts as well to function properly? Would your spine need to be reinforced to handle the extra weight? Or could the intense force from such a powerful punch cause unintended harm to the fleshy bits of a person's back? Stupid, weak, fleshy bits. Replace them all. Put my brain in a robot. Come on. And then there's the fear of infection from having something permanently attached to and extended out of the human body. For those that have had arms attached to their skeletons, this is a concern, especially in the eyes of the FDA, but thus far, the risk of infection seems to have remained low in the small sample size that exists thus far. But look, even if it turns out we can't give ourselves superhuman physical abilities, there seems to be nothing other than the maturation of technology preventing us from gaining superhuman powers of perception at least. Physical prowess has never really been mankind's strong suit anyway, so finding ways to improve our senses and perceive the world in new ways may be the real future of cyborg technology. Besides, as badass as it would be to be able to punch through all, it becomes a lot less cool if everyone has that ability anyway. But since there's a good chance futuristic cyborgs will exist in some form within our lifetimes, we'll have to just wait and see what direction they go. But let's just guess that research is going to focus on the said stuff rather than making me a cool arm-punching robot arm. Thanks for watching.